So this is chapter nine, Gathering Blue. In chapter eight, Kira goes to the woods, to the forest where the creatures, you know, live, to go see Annabella, to learn how to make colors. That's what her mother never taught her. She arrives with Matt and Branches. Remember, Matt's the poor kid with his dog, Branches. And Annabella is a very old lady, and she has a walking stick to help her move like Kira, because she's an old woman. Annabella teaches her which plants to make different colors. And this is something that Annabella has to learn to help make or repair or add to the singer's dress, the robe. And as Kira is leaving, she's asking Annabella how to make blue. And Annabella points to a path that used to be used, but now it's covered by trees and grass and tells Kira that she doesn't have any, but she has to go that way to find it. And it's kind of mysterious, this path. Um, and that's the end of chapter eight review. So chapter nine, Gathering Blue. The singer's robe contained only a few tiny spots of ancient blue, faded almost to white. After her supper, after the oil lamps had been lit, Kira examined it carefully. So she's holding this big dress in her hands. She lay her threads, the ones from her own small collection and the many others that Annabella had given to her on the large table, knowing she would have to match the hues carefully in daylight before she began the, repair, the repairs, making sure the colors are similar that she uses. It was then that she noticed, with relief because she would not know how to repair it, and with disappointment because this color of sky would have been such a beautiful addition to the pattern, that there was no real blue anymore, only a hint that there once had been. So she's looking at it and she realizes that the color blue isn't even there anymore. The colors faded over many years. She said the names of the plants over and over aloud, trying to make a chant of them for easier memory. Holly, hock and tansy, madder and bed straw. But they fell into no comfortable rhythm and did not rhyme. Thomas knocked at the door. Thomas is the boy, that's the carpenter that makes things with wood. Kira greeted him happily, showed him the robe and threads and told him of her day with the old dyer, Annabella. I can't remember all the names, she said in frustration. But I'm thinking that if in the morning I go back to where my old cot was, maybe my mother's garden plants, the one she used for colors will still be there. And then seeing them, the names will mean more. I only hope Vandera, remember Vandera was the lady, the big tough lady. She paused. She had not told the carver about her enemy and even saying the name made her apprehensive and nervous. The woman with the scar, Thomas asked. Kira nodded. Do you know her? He shook his head, but I know who she is, he said. Everyone does. He picked up a little skein of the deep crimson. So like a deep red, crimson's like a red color. How did the dyer make this? He asked curiously. Kira thought, madder for red. Madder, she recalled, just the roots. Madder, he repeated. Then an idea came and occurred to him. I could write the names for you, Kira, he suggested. It would make remembering easier. You can write and read? Thomas nodded. I learned when I was young. Boys can, the other ones who are chosen. And some of the carving I do has words. But I can't. So even if you were to write the names, I couldn't read them. And it's not permitted for girls to learn. Still, I could help you in the remembering. If you told them to me and I wrote them, then I could read them to you. I know it would help. She realized he was probably right. So he brought a pen and ink and paper from his quarters. And once again, she said the words, those that she could recall, that she could remember. In the flickering light, she watched as he carefully wrote them down. She saw how the curves and lines in combinations made the sounds and that he was then able to say them back to her. When he read the word uh, hollyhock aloud with his finger on the word, she saw that it was long with many lines like tall stems. She turned her eyes away quickly so that she would not learn it and would not be guilty of something clearly forbidden to her. But it made her smile to see it, to see how the pen formed the shapes and, sh the sh the shapes, and the shapes told a story of a name. So very simply, the boy is writing down the names of the colors or of the plants that make colors to help her. And in this society, remember, the men hunt and do all of the work, uh, the physical work, and the women stay home, clean, look after the babies, and they are not allowed to learn.
Very early in the morning, Kira ate quickly and then walked to the place where her mother's colour garden had been, back to her old house. Few people were up and about yet at sunrise. She half expected to encounter Matt and Branch, but the paths were mostly empty and the village was still quiet. Here and there a tyke cried and she could hear the soft clucking of chickens, but the noisy clangour of daytime life was yet to come. Approaching, she could see the pen that was already partly built. Remember, they're making a building to put their tykes in, their babies in? It had been only a few days, but the woman had gathered thorn bushes and circled them around the remains of the cot where Kira had grown up. The encircled ground was still ashes and rubble. Very soon, the thorned fence they were building would enclose the area completely. She supposed that they would create some kind of gate and that they would shove their chickens and their tykes inside. There would be sharp pieces of woods and jagged fragments of broken pots. Kira sighed, seeing it. The tykes would be scratched and splintered by scraps of her own destroyed past, but there was nothing she could do. She edged quickly past the wreckage and the half-built fence and found the remains of her mother's colour garden at the edge of the woods. The vegetable garden was completely stripped, no more vegetables, but the flower plot remained though its plants were trampled, people walking on them. Clearly, the woman dragging their bushes to build the pen had simply walked across the area. Yet the blossoms, the flowers, continued to grow and bloom, and she was awed to see that vibrant life still struggled to thrive despite such destruction. So she goes to where her old house was, and she sees that the house is obviously burnt, and that they're creating a fence, okay, using a type of bush, like a type of, uh, like a small tree, uh, to stop people from going in. And she goes to the garden, the garden's destroyed, but there are still some flowers her mother used remaining. She named, them to, she named them to herself, though she remembered, and picked what she could, filling the cloth she had brought. Annabella had told her that most of the flowers and leaves could be dried and used later. Some, like bronze fennel, should not. Use it fresh, Annabella had said of the fennel. You could eat it too. Kira left it where it grew and wondered if the woman would know that it could be harvest for food. A dog barked nearby and now she could hear arguing. A hubby, a man, shouting at his wife and a tyke being slapped. The village was, was waking up to its routine. It was time for her to go. This was not her place anymore. Kira gathered the cloth around the plants she had collected and tied the edges together. She then slung it over her shoulder and picked up her walking stick and hurried away. On a back path, avoiding the central lane of the village, Kira saw Vandera and averted her eyes. The woman called her name in a smug, taunting voice. Liking your new life? She called and followed the question with a harsh laugh. Ha ha ha. Quickly, Kira turned a corner to escape a confrontation, a fight. But the memory of the sarcastic question and the woman's smile and smirk took and accompanied her home. She couldn't forget it. I need a place to grow a colour garden, she told Jameson hesitantly a few days later, and an airy place for drying the plants. Also a place where a fire can be built and pots for the dying. She thought some more, then added, and water. He nodded and said that such things could be provided. He came each evening to her quarters to assess her work and ask her needs. It seemed strange to Kira that she could make requests and to have them answered. So she's used to not being treated very nice. But Thomas said it had always been so for him too. The kinds of wood, ash, heartwood, walnut or curly maple, each had been brought when he asked. And they had given him tools of all sorts, some he had never even known of before. The days, busy ones, tiring ones began to pass. One morning, as Kira prepared to go to the dyer's hut, Annabella, Thomas came to her room. Did you hear anything last night? He asked her uncertainly. Maybe a sound that woke you up? Kira thought. No, she told him. I slept soundly. Why? He seemed puzzled as if he were trying to remember something. I thought I heard something like a sound, like the sound of a child crying. I thought it woke me, but maybe it was a dream. Yeah, I guess it was a dream. He brightened and shrugged off the little mystery. I've made something for you, he told her. I've been doing it in the early mornings, he explained, before I start my regular work. What is your usual work, Thomas? Kira asked. Mine's the robe, the singer's robe, of course. But what have they sent you to do? 
the singer's staff, like a big stick. It's very old, and his hands, and the hands of other singers in the past, I suppose, have worn the carvings down, so it must all be repaired and recarved. It's difficult work, but important. The singer uses the carvings of the staff to find his place, to remind him of the sections in the song, the song where they talk about the history of their community. And there's a large place at the top that has never been carved. Eventually I'll be doing that, carving it for the first time, making my own designs. Remember, carving is when you put something in the wood and you make a shape or a picture or a word. He laughed. Not my own, really. There, tell me what to put there. Here, shyly, shyly, timidly, Thomas reached into his pocket and handed her the gift. He made her a small box with a tight-fitting lid, its top and sides intricately carved in the patterns of the plants she was beginning to learn and to know. She examined it with delight, with happiness. She recognised the tall spikes of yarrow and its dense, clustered blossoms. Around them twined the flopping stems of Cusiroposis, above a carved plant mounded dark and feathery leaves. So, so Thomas gives her a box, and the box has little pictures, drawings, carvings of the flowers. She knew instantly that she wanted to place what she wanted to place and put inside this exquisite box. The small scrap of decorated cloth that she had carried in her pocket on the day of the trial and that comforted her loneliness when she held it before sleeping was hidden away in one of the drawers that contained supplies. She no longer carried it with her because she feared losing it during her long walks through the woods and her long days hard at work with the dyer. Now, with Thomas watching, she fetched the scrap and put it in the box. It's a lovely thing, he said, seeing the small cloth. Kira stroked it before she closed the lid, the top. It speaks to me somehow, she told him. It almost, it seems almost to have life. She smiled, embarrassed, because she knew it was a weird and odd thing that he would not understand and could perhaps find her foolish and dumb. But Thomas nodded. Yes, he said to her surprise. I have a piece of wood that does the same. One I carved long ago when I was just a tyke. And sometimes I feel it in my fingers still, the knowledge that I had then. He turned to leave. That you had then? No more? The knowledge doesn't stay? Kira was dismayed and confused at the thought, but she said nothing to her friend. So you know how Kira held a piece of cloth fabric in her hand that reminds her of her mother and makes her feel good? I guess Thomas has the same, but it's a piece of wood. Though there was still so much information she needed to acquire from Annabella, Kira was forced to make her learning time at the dais cot shorter because it was important to begin to work on the singer's robe, and she needed the daylight. She was glad now of the tiled bathroom that had caused her such confusion at first. The warm water and soap helped to, to rid her hands of stains of the colours in her hands, and it was important, vital, that her hands be clean when she touched the rope the robe. She still had her small frame, the one that Matt had saved from the fire, but there was no need for it. Among the supplies provided for her was a fine new frame that unfolded and stood on sturdy wooden legs so that it was not necessary to hold it on her lap. She placed the frame by the window so she could sit in the chair beside it while she worked. So she's talking about the thing that makes clothes that she used to have that Matt saved from the fire, but she doesn't need it anymore because where she is now, she has everything. She spread out the robe on the large table to examine it carefully and select the place where she would begin her work. Now, for the first time, Kira began to perceive the vastness from which the singer created his song. The entire history of the people, culminating with the horrifying story of the ruin, was portrayed with immense complexity on the voluminous folds of the robe. So it's describing how big this robe is, that there's so many stories on it from the ruin. So the ruin was the time where everything was destroyed. And she's looking at the robe and realizing how big this story is. Kira could see pale green sea and its depth fish of all kinds, some larger than man, larger than 10 men together. So the history of the seas. Then the sea blended imperceptibly into the sweeping areas of land populated only by the figures of animal life unknown to her, hulking creatures grazing on tall tan grasses. So she's just describing again what she sees on the robe, 
an, like an area of the robe is about the sea and the fish. The next area of the robe is about the land and the big creatures. All of this was only one small corner of the singer's robe. As her eyes moved along, she saw that out of the pale sea near the grazing land rose other land, and on this land appeared men. The tiny stitches created figures of hunters with spears and weaponry, and she saw that the little knots of red, madder for red, just the roots, had been used to colour blood on the figures of fallen men, those taken by beasts. So again, the robe is telling the story, and this part of the robe tells the story of men hunting and men getting killed by beasts, like Kira's father. She thought of her father, but this scene was long ago, long before her father, long before any of their people. The lifeless and dead men, dotted with red knots of blood, were still an infinites inf infinitesimal section of the robe. A blink of an eye, forgotten now except for the once-a-year song, the time that the singer reminded them of the past. So this robe tells the past of their life, of all of the community. Looking at the robe and smoothing it with her washed hand, Kira sighed and realised that she did not have time for such study. There was important work to be done, and she had noticed Jameson's increasing sense of urgency, making her be quick. Again and again he came to her room, checking, making certain that she was attentive to her job and would be meticulous in the work. So making sure that she's doing her job. Identifying a place on one sleeve that badly needed repair, Kira moved that section of the robe into the frame, which it held, which held it taut. Then carefully, using the delicate cutting tool she had been given, Kira snipped away the frayed threads, so she's getting rid of the old pieces of fabric. There was a small stain across an intricately threaded flower in shades of gold, part of a landscape that betrayed rows of tall sunflowers near a pale green stream of river. Someone long ago, someone skilled in the art, had made the stream appear to flow by stitching white curving lines that gave a sense of foam. How gifted the earlier threader had been, but those stained threads would need to be replaced. So she's just saying that the, the robe is in bad condition, that she has to repair a lot of things, but the person that used to make them did a great job. The work was painstakingly slow. Her mother, though her fingers had not had not had the almost magical knowledge that Kira's had, would have been more experienced, more defter, and faster. She held the new gold threads to the window and examined the subtle shifts in hue, choosing just the right ones for the repair. So she's choosing the right colour. When the late afternoon light began to dim, Kira stopped work. She looked at the few inches in the frame, assessing what she had accomplished, what she had done, and decided that she was doing well. Her father would have been pleased. Jameson would be pleased. She hoped that when the time came to don the robe, the singer would be satisfied as well. But her fingers ached, they were in pain. Kira rubbed them and sighed. This was not at all the same as her own threadings, the small pieces she had done throughout her childhood. It was certainly not like the special one that had begun to move of its own volition in her hand besides her mother's deathbed, to twist and mix the threads in the way she had never learned, to form patterns she had never seen. Her hands had never been tired then. Thinking of that special scrap, the one she made, Kira went to the carved box, unfolded the bit of cloth and put it in her pocket. It felt familiar and welcome there, as if a friend had come to visit. It was almost time for her evening meal to be brought. Kira covered the spread out robe with a plain cloth to protect it. Then she went along the corridor and knocked on Thomas's door. The young carver was almost just finishing his work when he called, come in. Kira entered and saw that he was wiping the blades of his tools and putting them away, so he's finishing. The long staff lay across his work table, held in a clamp. He smiled when he saw her. They had begun to eat their evening meal together each night. Listen, Thomas said and pointed to his windows. She could hear noise coming from the central plaza below. Her own room facing the forest was always quiet. What's happening? Take a look, they're preparing for a hunt tomorrow. Kira moved to the window and looked down. Below, the men were gathering for the distribution of weapons. Hunts always began early in the morning. The men left the village before sunrise, but this was preparation. Kira could see that doors had been opened in an outbuilding beside the council edifice where she is. 
and from the storage place long spears were being brought and placed in piles in the centre of the plaza. Men were lifting the spears, testing the weight, looking for the one that felt right. There were arguments. She saw two men with their hands grasping the same spear shaft, each determined to keep it, to hold on. These are weapons. They were yelling at each other. In the midst of the noisy chaos, Kira saw a small figure dart in among the men and grab a spear. No one else seemed to notice. They were all absorbed with themselves, shoving and pushing and arguing. She saw that one man was already blooded from a spear point, and it was clear that others would be injured before the disorganized disruption was complete. No one paid any attention to the boy. From her place in the window, Kira watched as the figure, holding an undisputed spear, moved triumphantly to the side of the crowd. A dog scampered by his feet. So this little boy runs in, where all the men are fighting with each other to get the best weapon. And it's Matt, Kira cried in dismay. He's just a tyke, Thomas. He's much too young for a hunt. When Thomas came to the window, she pointed. He followed her finger and finally saw Matt where he stood it to the side with his spear. Thomas chuckled. Sometimes boy tykes do that, he explained. The men don't care. They let them follow along for the hunt. But it's too dangerous for a tyke, Thomas. What do you care? Thomas seemed genuinely curious. There are any tykes. There are too many of them anyway. He's my friend. He seemed to comprehend then. She saw his face change. He looked down toward the boy with concern. Kira could see that Matt was encircled by the pack of mischief makers who were often at his side. They were admiring him as he brandished the spear. Kira felt a startling sensation, a throbbing in her lip, in her hip. She reached for it, intending to rub it away, thinking that perhaps she had leaned too hard against the windowsill. Then her hand went instinctively to her pocket. She remembered that she had placed the, the scrap of cloth there. She touched the fabric and felt tension, danger, and a warning from it. Please, Thomas, Kira said urgently, help me stop him. So that's the end of the chapter. So very simply, this chapter, Kira is working, and she wants, she goes to where her old house was to find the old plants her mother used to make colors. She picks them up and she leaves, and a woman gives her a nasty smile. She goes back and she's beginning to work. Her hands are really tired from all of the moving she has to do. The robe is really big, and she realizes how much work she has. Jameson's checking on her because she knows that she has to get this finished, and it has to be perfect. Later, when she finishes her work, she goes to see Thomas. Thomas invites her in, and she looks at the staff the singer holds. Then out the window... They see that all the men are getting ready to hunt. So all the men are gathering together and getting their weapons. Some are fighting with each other. And she sees that Matt, her friend, is going to join on the hunt. Remember, Kira's father died on a hunt. That's the